like you to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Thank you, Dorothy and Rhoda. Ephesians chapter 4. Among humanity, biblically speaking, you have believers and you have unbelievers. And somewhere in between, you have unbelieving believers. An unbeliever is someone who is not born again of God's Spirit. Someone who has never confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believed that God raised him from the dead, so they do not have that Spirit within them. At the moment someone confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believes that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says they're what? Saved. And to be saved is to be born again of God's Spirit, to have that power from on high, that dunamis, that potential inherent within your life. As Stevie said tonight before she sang that brand new me, to have, to be a threefold being, body, soul, and what? Right, to have all three. Not just a body and soul man, five senses, flesh trip, but to be body, soul, and spirit. But once a person is born again of God's spirit, once someone has that spirit of Christ on the inside, does that guarantee that his walk will be absolutely perfect in every way? No, there are few people may want to believe that. <laughs> all I have to do is live with people a little while. <laughs> right. If you ever lived with me, you found out I'm not perfect. If you ever lived with anybody, you found out they weren't exactly perfect. But we have the availability of God's Word to fill our minds that we can get closer and closer to that perfect walk. A person who's born again of God's Spirit, who has that Spirit on the inside, which way is he he heading? Heaven or the other way? <laughs> heaven. That's right. He's heaven bound. There's nothing can stop him because it's seed born in that individual. But that does not guarantee that his mind has been renewed, that he's walking perfectly upon that word. And if he isn't, then he's what we call an unbelieving believer. He's a believer because he's born again, but he's an unbelieving believer. You see the difference? Now, God doesn't just want people who are believers, who are born again. He wants that, praise the Lord, when they are. But he also wants people to be believing believers. Believers who not only are born again, but they have the word in their mind and they walk that word. This past week has been an experience for me because I've ran into a number of opportunities where I've been out in the world, I've run across these before, and I'm sure that many of you have, or if not all of you, you should have, if you had your eyes and ears open, because the world is not geared to bless people. <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> but it just blew my mind again how unthoughtful and how unkind their words and actions many times were. In some situations where, man, you just, you know you have to have the love of God in your heart and the tenderness in your soul. But the world, they're just not geared that way. They don't have the love of God. Well, how can they if they're not born again of God's Spirit? And some of them may be born again, but still, it's an unkind word or an unkind act. That produces the negative. I thank God that we not only are born again of God's Spirit, but that we have the knowledge of His Word that we don't have to walk in darkness, that you can bless people. Because when an unkind word is said, or an unkind action is done, you cannot undo it. You can't put that apple back on the tree. You cannot put those rose petals back together and produce the same fragrance that you did before. That's why we as believers not only are born again, but we get to that place where you 
put on more and more of God's Word, that your walk and your life becomes a continual blessing to people wherever you go. In Ephesians chapter 4, you've got a great record dealing with the renewed mind. And in verse 17 it says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Now, let me ask you a question. To whom is Ephesians addressed? To the church, not to the Jew, not to the Gentile, but it's addressed to the church. Before someone is born again of God's Spirit, he's either a Jew or he's a Gentile. But once he's born again of God's Spirit, he is neither Jew nor Gentile, but he's a member of the church of God. He's God's son, one of God's heirs, one of God's children. Therefore, how can this be correct when it says that you walk hence, henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk? With the word other, it implies that you are a Gentile, that there are other Gentiles as well, right? And the word other is not in the majority of critical Greek texts and the manuscripts. The word other should not be in there. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth, after this, walk not as Gentiles walk. Then it makes sense. Because this is addressed to the church, not to the Gentiles. No, this isn't addressed to the Gentiles. It's addressed to those born again in the church of God. See? That you walk not as Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their what? Mind. See? The Gentiles, not talking about the church of God, we're talking about Gentiles, those who are not even a part of the, the Jewish trip, Judea. They were Gentiles fleshwise. And they walked, it says, in the vanity of their what? And that word mind is the word noose. If you've ever had the class on the renewed mind, the nous, N-O-U-S, is the Greek word which means the entire organ of mental perception. It's the mind itself, not the physical thing, the brain, but the mind, the mental thing. The mind, the whole thing, not just a part of it, not just a thought that goes in there, but the whole mind. It says these Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Their whole mind is vain. Having the understanding darkened, and that understanding is the inner workings, the inner workings of the mind. The, the thought patterns, the desires that are in the mind, all the ideas that go into that mind, the motives, the, the concept, everything in that mind, that's the understanding to the point that it makes sense. <laughs> well, their understanding, the inner workings of their mind, it says they have it darkened. It's darkened. If we turned out all the lights in here, and including these, like we did a while ago, we didn't get these out because we weren't supposed to, but if we turned out all the lights, wouldn't you have a great understanding of what's in this room? <laughs> suppose you walked into this room and there had not been any lights on at all can you imagine trying to find your way around in here especially if you've never been to international huh man you walk in that door and you, you can't see a thing because it's totally dark or as close to total as you can get and you, you can't see anything so you walk in and the first thing you do, you run into a chair. And then the next thing you do, you run into Danny Stevenson back there. And pretty soon, you are you just don't know where anything is. And that's the way the mind and the understanding of natural man is. Totally darkened. He can't really find his way around. Now, he thinks he can, and that's exactly what he does. If you've ever been in college and or high school, as far as that goes, any other academic place where... You get a certain amount of knowledge here. You get another 
certain amount of knowledge over here and you try to pattern those things together. When it comes to the word of God, which is, the, which is spiritual knowledge, God says, yea, and so. Then you either accept it as God's word or you reject it and have problems. When you accept it as God's word, life patterns, life fits. You've got the answers to life that you need. But natural man, not knowing God's word, he finds certain facts over here. For example, he may learn from one source that there are certain things going on in the world. For example, at spiritualist meetings. He says, why tables move around, things come in and just float in the air and drop, and a few other things. So one natural man says, well, boy, this is great. Now, I think the thing that's causing it, see, he can't see the cause behind it, so he starts guessing. He says, well, now, why, that must be my grandmother who died several years ago bringing those things in here to bless me. <laughs> Another natural man says, well, no, that's not right at all. They've simply got strings attached to these items or ropes or something. And somebody else says something else. See, all guesswork because they can't see spiritually behind it. God's Word tells you exactly what each situation is in life. Yea and yea and nay and nay. Not yea and nay. <laughs> Not maybe. But thus saith the Lord. See it? Exactly what it is. But the natural man, his understanding is what? Sure. He, he feels something. Oh my gosh, this must be a lectern. Or is it a chair? <laughs> See? He can only grope. He can only guess at what it is. He actually doesn't know. But it says their understanding is darkened, being alienated from the life of God. See? They're from outer space, far out. No. Alienated, foreigners, from the life of God. Do they have the spirit within them? These Gentiles? No. No spirit. They're alienated from the life of God. Through the ignorance that is in them and the word ignorance is agnoia in the greek if you want it it's a combination of the prefix a and gnosko if you know what that is some of you do remember what gnosko means to know That's right to know it has to do with knowledge and the prefix a negates it makes it mean the opposite without knowledge that's what it means. These Gentiles are alienated from the life of God through ignorance, which means to be without knowledge that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The heart is the innermost part of the mind, the seat of the personal life. And the word blindness means hardness, like a paralysis. <laughs> Can you imagine a paralysis of the heart? The hardness of their heart. Because of the hardness of their heart, the innermost part of the mind. That's why they're without knowledge. They're ignorant. And because of that, they, they're alienated from the life of God. They don't want to come to the life of God. You know what God says? He says, well, if you want my life, if you want to have my spirit, hey, can you imagine having the spirit of God within you? Well, you've got it. <laughs> but sense knowledge wise, can you imagine the greatness of that thing? Well, spiritually, can you imagine the greatness of that thing? The spirit of God to be living within you. And God's word says, now if you want that, if you really want to get that, you've got to be real committed. You've got to be on your knees at least eight hours a day. And you've got to do at least 25 good deeds every day. 
to people that you don't know. And the people that you do know, you've got to do 50. And besides that, no. God says you just do what? Believe. <laughs> Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead and it says you're saved. Born again of God's spirit. <laughs> it's so simple. Why doesn't the Gentile then, or the Jew for that, for the most part, why do they not want to come to that life when it's so easy? Because their hearts are hardened. Because of the hardness of their hearts. They just shut up their hearts and they won't let, let the tenderness of God and the peace of God come into their heart. That's why. That's why they're ignorant without knowledge. That's why they are aliens from the life of God. But there are a few Gentiles in this world and a few Jews who do not have that hard heart. And they're the ones that will hear God's word to be a become a part of God's wonderful family. They're waiting on people like you to come out and tell them all about it. That's right. Look at verse 19, these Gentiles, who being past feeling, these Gentiles, past feeling, and that word past feeling means hardened or calloused. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, I saw this again this week. I've seen it many, many times before, and I'm sure you have. How callous the world is. I was waiting by the school one day. I hadn't really thought much about it since it happened, but it bothered me at the time, waiting on my son to come out. And while I was waiting, there was children coming out of the school. And one of them, you know how children are, they, they you know, they do something just like us adults do once in a while. Have you ever stumbled? Well, that's what this one boy did. And the others that were with him kept walking and they started laughing about it like it was something hilarious. Now, perhaps that happens among our own children once in a while, but I think with the training of the Word, like we do in our children's fellowship here on Sunday night, in the twigs with our children's activities, with the parental training of our children, that you don't have that so much, perhaps. <laughs> but you see, the love of God tenderizes an individual, whether they're a child or an adult. And it really bothered me that the children would laugh at one of their peers, one of the people that they worked with, that they studied with at school. But that's a part of growing up, part of life. And with the proper training, those children will learn that, well, here's a child who has stumbled, or here's someone that has fallen down. Should I help him up? Or what can I do that would bless him, that would make him feel not quite so awkward, or that would, you know, get rid of the, what do you call it, blushing, <laughs> the embarrassment. Boy, in the world, you see very little tenderness. The people become callous, hardened. They promote that which is contrary to the word and contrary to blessing people. Last night, I did something I don't do very often anymore, watch television. And on this one particular program, if any of you happen to see it, they were talking about one fellow who was a, I won't tell you the name of the show, but he was a TV broadcaster. And um, he, had he was going for a better job. And they had despised him all the time he had been at work. And now he was leaving and they were sort of saddened by it. 
And they were trying to think of ways to keep him there. And they could say, well, what, what good could we tell him, you know, that, that he had done, that we want to keep him there? And the one individual proposed to the other one, well, lie a little bit. And nobody thought anything about it, but I did. When you tell a lie, is it the word? No, it's contrary to the word. And that, along with perhaps a hundred other things that happened that evening to mess up my life, <laughs> it really, really hurt me every time I heard something like that that was contrary to the word. Man, when you have to lie in a situation to get to save your face or do something else, that's just not the love of God in your heart. But that's how callous the world is. That's how hardened their hearts are. I still remember and saw it this, about a week ago or so, that Rock of Ages film from, from 72, I believe it was, where Dr. Werwell was teaching and he said, after a number of other comments, have the love of God shed abroad in your heart. The world can't. The world can only, only imitate love. You and I can have the love of God shed abroad in our heart. That's the difference. Because you're born again of God's Spirit and you can walk by His Word and by that Spirit that's in you. That's the difference. But these Gentiles, they were past feeling, hardened, callous, who being past feeling or callous have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, which is lust, to work all uncleanness. And that uncleanness is the lowest point of lust and sexual activity it's used in the context of the homosexuality in Romans chapter 1 to work with all uncleanness. This is the point that the Gentiles had reached with greediness or covetousness, just trying to sap the last dollar and bit a life out of everybody they could. Hey, does it sound like the 20th century? <laughs> Times haven't changed as far as the world is concerned. It's the same world, the same things going on. Those Gentiles had reached the lowest ebb of life. They were trying to cheat their brother and sister out of everything they could because of that covetousness and all the other things. Hearts were calloused, hardened. See it? But verse 20, but, 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 what does but mean? <laughs> means contrast. But ye have not so learned Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There are still a few people in this world who aren't callous like that, who have the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off. Hey, put off. Is this in the category of your salvation? No. This is something that you and I can do. You put off. Salvation is by grace. Your walk is by work. When you can put off something, that's work. Sometimes hard work to put off a few things. But our salvation was by grace. We're born again of God's Spirit. You've got Christ in you, the hope of glory. But now, you're not just an unbelieving believer because you can also put off, put off, put off concerning the former conversation or behavior, your former behavior, the way you walked in life before, that you can put it off. The old man, that's not your dad <laughs> or your husband. <laughs> that's this thing, you know, under this shirt. <laughs> I won't demonstrate this part. <laughs> the flesh, the body and soul part of man. That's the old man. You put off 
that former behavior, the old man. Well, what did your old man do? You know, this part of you, the body and soul part. Was he the one that went around blessing everybody? Or was he the one that tripped people? <laughs> Got to show this half what I show that half. <laughs> was he the one that blessed people or was he the one that was covetous? <laughs> that tried to get everything he could? The one that had to look after Joe himself. That's the way it was in my life. I learned a little bit about the word. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be subtracted from you. No. All these things shall be what? Added unto you. <laughs> That's right. And you don't have to go around seeing what you can get out of the next fellow. Seeing how much life and other things you can pull out of him. You just bless people with the greatness of the word of God and the spirit of God living in your life. And all these things just going to flow back to you. It's a law. As you give, you're going to do what? Receive. Oh, it's the greatest life. If we got there and there was no gathering together, it'd still be the greatest life going because you never get blessed so much as you do in this ministry. <laughs> That's right. But I'm absolutely persuaded there is a gathering together. Because we've got the proof in the senses world you are born again of God's Spirit. Well, you put off that former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt. He's what? Corrupt. According to the deceitful lusts. They're lusts that were in your life. And they were deceitful lusts. You thought, man, this is the only way to go. Man, this is it. Why, if there's a God, this is the way he made me, I'll go do what I want. You know, Get everything I can out of my brother. You thought that was it. That was the, the end and the means to the end and all the other ends and the means. Right? But they were deceitful lusts, it said. So you put off the old man the way you used to walk. Put it off and be renewed in the spirit or the life of your mind. Your noose, N-O-U-S. The mind that you are renewed up here in your mind. Put on the new man. See, you're renewed up here. The Gentiles, what kind of a noose did they have? It was vain, it said back in verse 17. In the vanity of their mind, their noose, their minds were vain. So was ours before we were born again of God's Spirit. But now we get a new mind somehow. <laughs> it says you're re renewed in the life of your mind. You renew this baby up here. See it? Get something new up in there. Be renewed in the spirit of the life of your mind and that ye put on. Do what? Put on the new man. You put off the old man, and now you put on the what? That Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Holy Spirit you received when you were born again of God's Spirit. Now you take him and put him on up here in the mind. That you put on the new man, which after God was created, is the text. It's Aris tense, past tense. After God was created in righteousness and true holiness. Look. When you were born again of God's Spirit, God created that life within you. He created it in righteousness and true holiness. That was that Holy Spirit you received when you were born again of His Spirit. Now He says you take that new man, not the old man, the body and soul, but that spirit, the new man, the one you... Well, what makes it new? You got it later than you got the other part of you. <laughs> right when you're when you were born the first time from your earthly mother and father you had this body and soul but when you were born of god's spirit you got a new man he's new because the old one's old and this one's later so that makes it new see? now you take that new man and you put him on up here see? put on the new man in your mind verse 25 wherefore putting away lying 
Hey, lying. Was that a trip of the new man or the old man? Why, that was the old man trip, wasn't it? Putting away lying. Speak every man, what? Truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. See, lying, that was the old man's way. The old man, the television, the radio, newspapers, everything else says lie. If you want to get past something, lie. The bigger the lie, the better. <laughs> right? That's the world. That's the old man. So you put off, put off the old man and put on the new man. The new man says, speak the truth with your neighbor. <laughs> There's no lie that's worth lying about. I want to tell you something. If you think that speaking the truth will get you into trouble, I want to tell you, God always finds a way out when you speak the truth. But if you tell a lie, you're going to be in some big trouble when somebody finds out. That's the word. So you put off the old man. Put on the new. Speak the truth. See? Isn't that beautiful? Verse 26. Be ye angry. Oh, no, 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 no. Not a Christian. Oh, Christians never get angry. No. Hey, what to say Jesus? Remember when the man had the withered hand, went up to heal him, and the Jews looked on him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus, it said, look on them with anger. Jesus Christ got angry. <laughs> Nothing wrong with getting angry when there's something to get angry at. And it says, be ye what? When people are walking on the word? Is that when you get angry? No! <laughs> no, you get angry when people are off the word. See? Be ye angry and blow your staff. Now, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and sin not. See the difference? You get angry, boy. <laughs> but you don't sin, see? just like Jesus did. Went into the temple one day and threw a few tables over, didn't he? Why? Because he was happy they were selling second-rate animals in the temple, huh? No. He was teed off, see? And he just went in there to set the place right. He threw the tables over. He drove the animals out with a cord. And he said, look, you birds. <laughs> right? He told them, point blank, straight in the face. Be angry and sin not. He didn't pull out a six-shooter <laughs> to those guys, did he? No, he didn't sin. But boy, he got angry when they were off the word. And those were the men that could have been on the word, see? Oh, man. Be angry and sin not. And let not your son, let not the son go down upon your wrath. You don't let it build up within you. When you get angry, you take care of the situation. You see somebody doing something that's not right on with the word, whether it's telling a lie or anything else. You say, look, tell the truth. That's what the word says. A lot easier. <laughs> A lot better. You get more accomplished. And then you know what you do? You keep remembering that for days and years. Man, why did they lie back in 1971? <laughs> no. Nah. You forget about it when the sun goes down. Right. Cool it. <laughs> I was going someplace with Dr. Irwell one time, and I was supposed to be at his house at, I believe it was, six o'clock in the morning and someplace along the line I got the idea in my head it was seven o'clock and so I didn't arrive there at six and I was off the word and so he told me we were an hour behind schedule in no uncertain terms because I was wrong you know what I did 
sat there in the car. And by the time we got to St. Mary's, Ohio, he had forgotten all about it, practically speaking. He was talking about something else, about what we were going to do that day, the joy and, you know, the words, see? No, you, when somebody's wrong and off the word, you tell them. If you know the word. <laughs> If you don't know the word, learn the word. <laughs> right. But you don't let it build up within you for days and years and everything else. You tell them once when they confess their sins to God, not to you. I don't go around confessing my sins to you and I don't expect you to confess your sins to me. Confess your sins to God. He's the one that's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, it says. First John, right? You bet your life. Well, and don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. At the end of the day, everything should be cool. Neither give place to the what? The devil? You mean there is such an animal? <laughs> there sure is. And Christians many times don't even realize it. And yet he's cutting their throat every day just on little things like what may seem little, but they're big as far as the word's concerned, like lying, like stealing, or anything else. See? Don't give place to him. Whenever I read that verse, I always think of a football game. You know, your man, your quarterback, he receives the ball and he's going to do something with it, either pass it or run it or hand it off or do something, right? Any football players in here? <laughs> Great. Now suppose you're one of the men on the line and the adversary, the devil on the other team or whatever, is coming. He's going to try to get that quarterback before he gets rid of the ball or before he runs very far, right? And your responsibility on that line is to guard the line to make sure he doesn't get through. But if you step aside and give place, See, you've given a place here that wide why he can run straight through and get your quarterback. <laughs> it's the same way spiritually. You don't give place to the devil. That's right. When he comes up to the line, you're standing there. You're defending your brother and sister in Christ. Somebody says something about an unbeliever, great. <laughs> in one ear, out the other. Somebody says something about you, I'll shove my fist down their throat. Because <laughs> you're one of God's kids. You're one of God's sons. That's right. And we've got to stand together because the world isn't going to stand for you. Now, maybe you do do something that's not quite according to the word once in a while, but you do more that's right with the word than the rest of the world does. And for that, I'll stand for you. That's right. <laughs> the world, they see one little thing they don't quite agree with. The things that they do agree with that are totally wrong, that, you know, that doesn't bother them. But they see one th little thing that's out of order with their theology or philosophy or doctrine, and, man, they're down the next person's throat. Whether it's their best friend, best enemy, or what? But not you and I. Their hearts are callous. See? They're hardened. You and I have the love of God shed abroad in your heart. Don't give place to the devil. Stand for the word. Stand for your brothers and sisters in Christ that the adversary doesn't get through the line. He tries to, to tell your brother or sister, I'll just tell a little lie. Or just steal a little bit. Or just murder a little bit. <laughs> you take the word up to that brother and sister and say, Look, what does the word say? Now let's walk together. <laughs> With the love of God in your heart. Not given place to the devil. Verse 28. Let him that stole pray for a while that God would somehow open a door for him to not steal anymore. No! Nope. Let him that stole do what? Steal no more. Let him iron for a while. No. 
When you when you've been stealing, it just says quit stealing. That must have been a combustible joke. <laughs> let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him do what? Boy, isn't the word beautiful? Every time it tells you not to do something, it gives you something to do in its place. <laughs> you quit stealing and start working. <laughs> Not great. <laughs> See, working with his hands, the thing that is what? Good. That he may have to give to him that needs. When you work, then you've got something. And you see a brother or sister or someone have a need. You can give them something. You can bless their life. But if you never work, how are you going to give anything to bless them? Huh? If you steal everything, well, you couldn't give it to them very well unless you're Robin Hood. <laughs> that wouldn't work too good. No. you work that you're able to bless people with your life, your actions, the, th the things that you do. The word is so great. Verse 29, let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You know, most people think of corrupt communications as a few four-letter words. Well, if it doesn't bless and doesn't edify, it might fall into that category. But for the most part, it's talking about all the the communication that tears people down, whether it's the nicest word, superficially speaking, but it still destroys people. That's corrupt communication. Anything that doesn't edify, that makes people feel like they're less than what they ought to feel. The word says, you're a son of God. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. The world says, well, now don't say that. You've got to be humble, brother. Get yourself down where <laughs> you can't feel too proud. Like we went to Nashville at that thing. And you've heard how our way production sings. You know, I've got a brand new me. <laughs> See? And a few things like everything's on with the word. But the attitude of the unbelieving believers was that it was just too haughty, too proud. Man, you can't... I hope that applause was for God type of thing. Well, if somebody does something great, bless them. That's right. <laughs> Whether it's a handshake, a hand clap, or whatever. I want to tell you something. In our ministry, we always give God the glory for everything. And if you don't, you've got a few problems. Because God's the one that made us what we are. And we recognize that. But when you go around confessing all the stupid negatives that always tear people down and make people feel like they're less than what they ought to feel, then you've got, you've got some problems. So you let that... No corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You just speak that which edifies. If you're feeling down about something and I come along I say... Boy, it must be about that time of life. Have you seen the best doctors lately? That didn't come out the way I meant it. <laughs> you better put on the new man. <laughs> but if I come along and give you words like, what does God say? <laughs> what does the Word say? Why don't you confess that? See? And anything that would build you up in that situation, that's putting the Word in your mouth instead of the corrupt stuff. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the what? Ears. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know what it means to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God? You've got that Holy Spirit in here, haven't you? Can that Holy Spirit be torn down, defeated, deteriorated, or anything? No, it's perfect. It's seed, incorruptible. 
It's perfect on the inside. So there's no way that could be less than what it is. But in the context here, what are we dealing with? Your sonship or your renewed mind walk? Renewed mind walk. If I never renew my mind, if I never put off corrupt communication, quit lying and put on the good stuff, then I'm grieving the Holy Spirit because I'm saved, born again, but I'm never walking it because it says I'm sealed under the day of redemption. Sealed. Completely sealed unto the day of redemption. You know what it means to be sealed? In the east, when they would write a letter, after they had written the letter, put it in the envelope or whatever, then they would, you know, put the flap over or whatever system they used, and they would take wax from a candle and drip it on there. Then they would take their signet ring, which was the ring of the household or family, and they would press it in that wax, which left their seal on that envelope. Some of our people do this in the ministry. I don't know if you've ever gotten a letter like that. I have. Where they have a ring or something that leaves an impression. That tells me that if that seal isn't broken, then I'm the first one to open it when I get the letter. But if the seal's been broken, then I know that Eddie Dersom or someone's been meddling with the mail. No. <laughs> he started to laugh ahead of time, so I had to get that in. You see, we're sealed with that Holy Spirit till the day of redemption when God redeems our body, when Christ returns. That means... God's going to be the first to open your envelope. <laughs> You've already got the Holy Spirit. You've got it. And when you've got it, you've got it. No way you can lose it. But the mind still has to be renewed. We still need to learn more of the Word. Put it on up here. Just flood our minds with the greatness of that Word. See, Put it on. And if you don't, that's to grieve the Holy Spirit because you're sealed under the day of redemption. So verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Put all those things off the old man and be ye what? Kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be kind, tender-hearted. What about the Gentiles? Where were their hearts? Callous, hard. But you, with the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, you can be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted, not callous, but tender, with the love of God living in your life, with that peace of God ruling in your heart. And then you can be kind one to another. And you can forgive one another. As God for Christ's sake hath what? Just stop and think what God forgave you for. I know what he forgave me for. So I can forgive my brother and sister. And I'm sure some of you have committed at least one sin in your life that God forgave you for. Huh? And if you can just remember sometimes what God forgave you for, you don't have any trouble forgiving others. Right. Be therefore imitators of God. Verse, five, verse 1. A follower is an imitator. One who imitated, who imitates. Be therefore imitators, imitators, <laughs> imitators of God as what? What do children do? They imitate their father and mother. They see what their father and mother do, and so they try it out. They do it. You know how our children learn to walk by the Spirit? How they learn to minister? They see their parents doing it. 
They see their parents living the Word. I still remember when I was, my one of my boys was quite young. They're still not very old, but <laughs> been a few years back. And I had busted my elbow on something. It was bleeding a little bit. And I was standing in the mirror, in front of the mirror in the bathroom, feeling sorry for myself. And he just came running up to me and grabbed my leg down here, and he started ministering to me. In the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> as far as he was concerned, that was it. Right. Because he had seen his parents do it. He had seen others do it. And he knew that God was the answer. That that's the only way to overcome some of these situations. It says we're to be imitators of who? God. See it? Oh, man. And walk in agape, love, the love of God in the renewed mind in manifestation. The love of God in your renewed mind as you put on the word in that mind and you manifest that spirit. You walk it. You live it. You practice God's presence in your life. The love of God in the renewed mind in manifestation. Walk in it as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice of God for a sweet-smelling savor. <laughs> Not tremendous? You live the love of God. You put it off. Did Christ love you? What did he do for you? Think about it for a second. Man alive! Then... Ought we not to love one another with that love of God in the renewed mind, in manifestation? The world will never see it, but the believers will, and especially those that put off the old man and put on the new and walk in the Word. Let the love of God reign supreme in their lives. I'd like you to go to Colossians chapter 3. And sometime this week, perhaps tomorrow, read this third chapter of Colossians because it also deals with that same subject that we were working in Ephesians about putting off the old man and putting on in its place the what? New man. And putting the spiritual things on in your head. Putting God's word on. Instead of lying, put off lying, put on truth. Speak the truth with your neighbor, that kind of thing. And I'd like you to read that chapter this week and really put these renewed mind keys in your, in your head that you don't forget it. Tremendous chapter. But I want to read with you the 23rd verse. At the close of this great chapter, he says, And whatsoever ye do, Whatsoever ye do, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. The word it is in italics and therefore not in the text. And it's interesting that the two do's, the do do, the second do is not the same as the first do in the Greek text. The first one means do, the second one means work. Work. Whatsoever ye do, work. How? Heartily. Put your heart into it. Work heartily as unto who? The Lord. To whom? <laughs> the Lord. And not unto men. You're working to the Lord and not unto men. Whatever you do, put on the new man. Work, work heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Who, from whom, will you receive your reward? The Lord Christ. When Christ returns, those of you who have renewed your minds to God's word, 
who have put off that old man, who have put on the new, who have, in whatsoever ye have done, have worked heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, it says you, when Christ returns, are going to receive a few rewards. The renewed mind and the work that you do by renewing your mind is not in vain. Ladies and gentlemen, it's worth the walk. Not only do you have the greatest life here upon earth today, the greatest joy in fellowshipping with people and helping people, but you've got rewards when Christ returns, it says. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ, and he rewards his people well. You're born again of God's Spirit. Heaven bound, all hell can't stop you. You could go to heaven and sit in the vestibule, the vestibule for eternity. Or you might get invited into the living room or the throne room or some other room. The rewards are after you get there for what you have done by renewing your mind to God's Word today. And I want to tell you, if you live that life today, the renewed mind life, you've got rewards in the future, but like I said, it's the greatest life today. If I hold animosity in my life or bitterness toward my brother or sister, do you know what that gives me? Ulcers? Heartache? Headache? <laughs> but if I only show the love of God toward my brother or sister, it gives me peace of mind. It gives me joy. It gives me the greatest life today, as well as those rewards in the future. So you live it. You walk it. An unkind word can't be unsaid, or an unkind deed can't be undone. We talk about 50-50 hindsight, or 20-20, hindsight. We've got to have 20-20 foresight, and the only way you can have it is by knowing what the Word says and then living it. And the rewards will be there, and the life will be the greatest.